created live on Fireside. The following program was recorded live on Fireside Chat. If you'd like to participate in these chats, join us every Thursday at noon Eastern Time at firesidechat.com slash Scott Monty. Have you ever admired a leader and wondered just what it is that makes her who she is? How he came to embrace the things that advanced him? Welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we look at the principles that define success. This is a show for leaders at all stages of their careers who aspire to understand what it truly means to be a leader. And who is a leader? John Adams said, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Together, we'll explore key principles, not only in the sense of the fundamentals, but also in the ethical sense. The habits, character traits, and virtues that form the backbone of leadership. Principles that are just as relevant and essential in the 21st century as they were in the 1st century. This is Timeless Leadership. Hello there, and welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we explore the principles and virtues that accompany successful and admirable leaders. I'm Scott Monty, and if you aren't yet subscribed to the Timeless and Timely newsletter, where I regularly write about these topics, please do so at scottmonty.com. And if you haven't given us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts yet for the Timeless Leadership Podcast. I'd appreciate you doing that. It helps other people find the show. This week, we're exploring patience. Now, in the Devil's Dictionary, Ambrose Bierce defined patience as a minor form of despair disguised as a virtue. And like many of his definitions, there's an element of truth to it. Patience isn't easy. I remember an old sketch by a comedy troupe called The Frantics, in which a group of students was learning the art of Tai Kwan Leap from a Zen master. And one of the students, Ed Gruberman, was bothered by the philosophical lessons, and he simply wanted to jump directly to the physical aspect of the martial art. The master reminded him that he needed to, uh, to learn to practice patience first. And... Gruberman was clearly harried and frustrated, and he said, yeah, 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 patience. How long will that take? Well, in an age when companies plan long-term strategies but focus on short-term results, and when rumors spread online at the speed of Twitter, do we have time for patience anymore? St. Augustine wrote, patience is the companion of wisdom. If that's the case, Society's impatience speak volumes about its intellect. Now, we've all heard the phrase, patience is a virtue, but beyond having bragging rights to a virtue, what are the practical aspects of patience? Well, for one, it can create a better performing team. Some recent research that I found has shown that when leaders demonstrate patience, their employees' self-reported creativity and collaboration increased by an average of 16%, and their productivity increased by 13%. So maybe there's something to this patience, if you have time for it, that is. Ted Wright has been at the forefront of -of word-of-mouth marketing since he helped reignite the Paps Blue Ribbon brand in 2000. Over the last decade, his agency, Fizz, has become a global leader in word-of-mouth marketing with clients on every continent. Often called the best word-of-mouth marketing speaker working today, Ted has won numerous public speaking awards for his talks on word-of-mouth marketing and always elicits more questions than a Q&A can handle. An alumnus of Booz Allen and Hamilton, Ted holds an MBA with honors from the University of Chicago. He also enjoys great bourbon and drives too fast, but never at the same time. Ted, welcome to Timeless Leadership. 
Thank you, Scott. I'm super glad to be here. Excellent. How are you? I am great. I am great. And I am trying to temper my own patience today because just before I hit the record button here, um, the sprinkler guy decided to turn on all the water around the house. So if there's background noise, well, we'll just live with it. I'm I'm, gl- I'm glad to do it. I think somebody's cutting the lawn next door. So. <laughs> it's always the way. And and here's the thing: you don't have control over these things. You know, they they simply happen, and you need to figure out a way to work around them. And to me, that's that's the hallmark of patience. I was pretty sure that you sent the lawnmower guy here. It's like, <laughs> I can't think you can talk about patience. It's my let's, gift. Let's try this. Watch this. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, Ted, we've known each other a long time, and you, to me, always seem to be like a man in a hurry, uh, a man who is unsatisfied with the present state of things. So, uh, you know, it seems a little odd that I would choose you to to speak with about patience, but but where, where do you come at this from? So I, I think that's true. I mean, I had a, you know, my own personal thing was uh, my dad passed when I was in high school. So uh, one of the ways that affected me was that, you know, death is, death, death is everywhere and death is around us and it can happen any time. So go, go, go. Um, and so in my 20s, I definitely was like, I need y'all to either be as, at my speed or I need y'all to get out of the way because I got to go. And, you know, you get you get fired often enough, you get, you know, sidelined often enough. And they're like, hmm, maybe I need to rethink that. So over the last 30 years, I have learned more and been rewarded more uh, by being patient. Um, And it's not a, you know, a selfless act. I mean, I have like lots of employees. And if I have found over the years that if I am patient and I would just wait for them to say what it is they're going to say, do what they're going to do, I'm amazed all the time. And I think, gosh, I would have, in a thousand years, I would have never thought about that. That is a great idea. Let's move forward with that. That's awesome. So selfishly, I have had to be um, practice the art of patience, patience with myself, patience with other people, and also patience with word-of-mouth marketing mm-hmm. because it's not an overnight thing. If you want to be successful, if you want to grow a brand from – couple million dollars a year in sales in the United States to just south of a billion dollars in sales in the United States. It doesn't happen in three quarters. And so you have to learn patience and you have to learn how to help other people be patient and recognize that we're not going to stand in the garden of marketing and yell at the tomatoes to grow faster, (laughs) grow faster, because (laughs) that doesn't work and that's not helpful for anybody. And so what you end up doing is you become impatient and you cut off the vast majority of the growth and the vast majority of the value before it's had time to really Mm. nourish. And and I suppose the part of the challenge here is we've all been exposed to the unicorns, these seemingly overnight successes. And in my experience, overnight successes are never overnight successes. There, There is so much that's hidden that you don't see so much work that goes into it. And yet we're exposed to the moment of victory and, and that tends to mislead us in some ways. How, how can we start to dig in and, and get to more of, you know, kind of the, I, I know there's no glamour around the work that goes into this stuff, but how can we make that more apparent to people? So I, I think one of the things that people just need to know is there is no such thing as an overnight success. They all take at least 10 years. And we tell our clients that are bands that are like that. And they're like, oh, it's like, it's fine. Just go back, go back to the history. I mean, the Beatles were a success, a great success, great. But they started here and then they had to go over here and play in a strip club in Germany for a couple of summers in order to get tight. And then they wrote some songs and then they did some stuff. And then all of a sudden they come to America and they're like, oh my gosh, this is an overnight success. Because all those people who are saying it's overnight success weren't actually down there watching music as it comes up and as it starts. Rap was like that. Rock and roll is like that. Um, Elon Musk is like that. Elon has been working on the Tesla thing and all the Tesla for well over a decade. 
I mean, he's been almost broke twice with that. It takes patience and it takes thick I don't know anything. Every once in a while, you can get lucky. Like there's a guy who wrote a book and he's like, uh, I was the first marketing guy at Google and is literally called the accidental millionaire. Like he just happened to be employee number 53, the first 52 were engineers and he was the right guy at the right time. And he made a bunch of money on his Google stock. So mazel for you. Uh, <laughs> And I'll just people, some people also win the lottery and they win $200 million on the lottery. That does happen. Most of the rest of us, all of the rest of us, you got to do all of the work it takes to set up all the parts of success. So when they all come together, you can take advantage of that and be quote successful unquote, no matter how you're defining that success. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm particularly inter- interested in your area of expertise when it comes to this, because you've been at the word of mouth marketing uh, effort for, gosh, two two plus decades now, right? I, I have. I am the lunatic guy <laughs> who graduates from business school and says, I've got a better idea. And all of the people in the industry go, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. And even if it was a better idea, they were making money doing the old way. And so they weren't, they, they were not able to pay attention, even if they had wanted to pay attention. Hmm. So you have to go out and you have to be patient and you have to know you got to prove your case. So that means you got to be patient. You got to go to a lot, talk to a lot of CEOs and CMOs and finally find one who's like, I have no idea. And this is what Brian Kovalchuk said to me. He was the CEO of the Paps Brewing Company. He said, he said to me, I have no idea if you're an idiot or a genius, but I got another meeting to go to. So I'll give you X number of markets and Y dollars, and then we'll talk at the end of that time. And I was, couldn't shake his hand fast enough. I was <laughs> like, cool, because we're going to start, because I thought this thing was going to work, but I knew that I, it was going to take a while and... Uh, fortunately, at that point, I was old enough to have started to be seriously practicing to be patient mm. because patience, as you pointed out, and as many other people, as you and I both posted on LinkedIn, I definitely got a lot of messages like, ha ha, you patience, oh, please, <laughs> right? And I'm like, I know that's the genius of Scott. He's like, I wouldn't expect this. This is just weird enough that I might listen in. And I'm like, ah, behold conversation. It's authentic. It's interesting. It's relevant. And I've got to prove that is authentic, that I'm just, you and I just haven't lost our minds. And we have the, the ADD guy who wants to talk about right. you know, patience. And, and that's the thing. I mean, particularly when you, you are ADD, neurodiverse, um, you, you need to train yourself in this way. It doesn't necessarily come naturally. And there are plenty of people out there who are not uh, on that neurodiverse spectrum who also don't practice patience just because the world around us tells us we have to respond, you know, now we have to get results next week. So, you know, it, it, when, when you started uh, Fizz and, and your work with, with PAPS, I want to, I want to talk specifically about that project in a moment. Um, this was in the earlier days of the internet. The, the, these were the days when, um, it was common parlance in, in a few years after you started where executives would say, I need a viral video, right, as kind of the, the shorthand for I need immediate results. Uh, so how, how do you approach something like that when they're asking for an output that isn't necessarily in alignment with reality? So this is where... And for all the folks that are listening and want to chime in, I'm super interested to hear other people as well eventually in this, in the part of this, this is where data is your friend. You just have to take those women and men that are in charge of things and say, great, I want that too. Here is how this thing works. Here is how sales work. Here's the number. Here's the spread rate of each individual person. This is how many they're connect with. You tell us what your what is your adoption rate from what, somebody hearing the message, and then we plug all those numbers in and say, okay. I mean, we have a client right now, and they said we need to be X dollars in order to be successful. 
how fast can we get there? And we did the calculations. We had like five years and three months. And we think we have 90% confidence that we can get there in five years and three months. He's like, five years and three months? He's like, wait, brother, don't flip out on us yet. Because we know you can't go to the boss and say, in a half a decade, I'll be able to do this. <laughs> there are steps along the way to be able to demonstrate to people that their patience in you and in the process is paying off. And here is how we know. And here are some incontrovertible facts. So, so take me on that journey with, with Pabst Blue Ribbon. What, what was the, the goal that they were trying to achieve? What was the problem perhaps they were trying to overcome? And, and how did you walk them through this multi-year process? Mm-hmm. So, all right, so remember, this is also the very beginning of us doing this stuff. So we're flying around in the seat of our pants, and I've got no data behind behind me. I've no, at this point, we have 20 years. We know the shape of the curve in order to be successful. We know that by different parts of the world. We know that by different industries. We have reams of data so we can have things that are close, substitutes to what you're doing, and so people can have an idea about what's going on. Uh, Pabst was different, and so... Uh, For those of you that are trying to work uh, intrapreneurially, uh, you always want to take something, some brand that nobody cares about if you have an idea. So, Scott, you were a long time at Ford. I would not have taken the the Mustang or the F-150 and said, I want to do something completely different. I would have said, I want to bring back the Ford Granada and we're going to make this the coolest thing ever. (laughs) And then people aren't going to care because I do we even make a Granada anymore. Shh, don't tell Scott and Ted, we don't even make that anymore. It's like, okay, we're going off and doing our thing. And then when you have, and they can then give you more patience because there's less at risk. So for us at Pabst, it, we were lucky of the 43 beer brands that they owned at the time. They were, PBR was 41st in volume and 42nd in profitability. So technically speaking, the more they sold, the more money they lost. So it was, it was not what was on anybody's top 10 things that we need to be concerned about. So our, the CEO, and he went to his CMO and said, what do you think about this? He's like, I, you know, I got to have a meeting about what ads we're going to do for uh, Old Milwaukee or whatever other beer brand that they were talking about, Shiner, or uh, one Shiner was Lone Star. Like, ah, that's what's important stuff. And I was like, okay. So we were kind of left alone to our own devices. So then early on, we could do the things that we could do. And there was so little volume sold that if we could just get this thing to kick a little bit, we got eye-popping percentage increases, which honestly didn't really make a material difference, but it allowed people to say, okay, let's give them another month. This thing is literally growing at this point. You're two months in, it's growing 300% a month. We haven't seen anything like this in 15 years, so let's go. And then we kept going, and the percentages get smaller over time, but your volume gets starts to get huge. And a year into it, of course, it's it's starting to look like it might be a hit. And the CEO has a meeting with all the other C's, and they say, okay, so now we're going to take this and we're going to do this. And to his ever-loving credit, he practiced patience, And he said, look, let's give these guys enough rope to either hang themselves or make one of those fancy rope hammocks for us. And and then we'll watch them. And until it starts to look like they're going to hang themselves, let's just leave well enough alone. And so that's how we were able to do that. And I mean, that program is fundamentally, I was just talking to somebody last week, that program is fundamentally unchanged for 20 years. Wow. I mean, there's still, it's still the same strategy, you know, and now 72 and sunny is going off and doing some TV commercials for different things. And they're going to have a hard seltzer and they've got a coffee beer and they've got all the rest of the stuff. And we can all make a decision whether or not that was a good idea for the brand or not. And, but I'm not in the room, so I don't know what the data is showing us. But at the end of the day, that brand still is about community and people who didn't have a home in beer having a home in beer and they liked that and they liked the two way interaction between the brand and these different subcultures that they were involved with. And, uh, it's still going on. That's amazing. So it's about patience. Yeah. And that thing, that thing's worth, I mean, that brand's gotta be worth a billion dollars 
like easy. So a, a, as you think about the success and the, the, the patients you trained into that particular brand team within the corporation, have you seen any evidence of that uh, kind of spilling over into other practices at the company? So that's a fun thing. And I can't, uh, so we left working with the Paps Brewing Company. So it got sold in 2009. And this guy bought the company for his kids to run. And they wanted to do beers that tasted like fruit with Snoop Dogg. And it was, it was a whole thing. So, but what I will tell you just in general for the clients that we have and have had over the last 20 years, once they see that it works, their particular portfolio companies are like, how do we take that same thing and do that over here? So how do you, you know, how do you take that voodoo that you do so well and do it for this brand or this part of the company or this other division that we have over here? Can you replicate that? Mm. And so that's really, and then, and then you can go to people and you can say, okay, last time it took us this long but you guys have kind of been training and changing how you're doing work over here. So we predict that we can probably get there three quarters of the time that we took for this first one. Because also we have less to prove to you all. And so you'll let us move a little faster. Yeah. And so one of the things about patients, I was thinking about this, you know, before we got on was also, if you can practice patience, you're also able to then be impatient like if you're impatient all the time or you're patient all the time, somebody sees you coming down the road and they're like, yeah, we already know what he's going to say. So we don't have to, we don't have to hang around in this virtual or physical hallway and hear what his little pitch is going to be because we already know that's what the guy is. So once you're patient and you're known as being patient, then you can be impatient with people and say, look, friends, I know you said you didn't have the money, but you've put $10 million into this and we know for a fact that you've got bottom line 56 million in EBITDA that your CFO can trace to this particular program. So you got a, so you got a five and a half to one ratio. We think we kick this up a notch and we think we start to commit 25 million a year and take this thing planet wide and let's go and try and hit 50 billion in total sales, you know, of incremental increased sales uh, in the next five years. So and they're like, what if we don't get there? And I was like, what if we're wrong at this point? You can be impatient with them. And you can say, let's say we're wrong by 90%. You're still getting twice back your money. And who on the board is going to be like, I don't like that we only got twice back all of our money. I wanted six times. It's like, that's not, that's not really rational. When other people are talking about, we grew 7%. Like, yeah. well, sorry, we only grew 200% this year. Sorry. <laughs> So that well, I mean that's important. So you've you've laid out you know a, a demonstrated ability to do something when someone has given you the time to do it when they've been patient with you, and then at that point you you combine patience with urgency, uh, which is an interesting dichotomy there, because typically you know when when we are pressured by quarterly results or you know deliver now there there is an urgency behind it, but it's more of a desperation. With, with regard to urgency, the, the way you've laid it out there, it's, it's taking, you know, at least some kind of demonstrated excellence and it, it's no longer a risk for them, but it's still an opportunity to move forward quickly. Yes, it's definitely less of a risk. There's always risk, or as we like to say, there's always hair on the deal. But when you can take a company that used to trade at $15 a share seven years ago when we started with them, and now they're trading at $350 a share. You have some grace with the C-suite when you say to them, hey, we see this thing coming down the pike. We should probably get prepared for this because if this other piece of business goes away, we need something to replace it with. Yeah. And they're like, mm -hmm. okay, we can take that shot. Because again, all right, instead of making 10 or 20 or 30 on our money, we can only make two. No one's really going to complain about a two X return right. that right. the CFO is certifying that that's not agency for all my friends who are listening on the agency side. That's not you all saying, Oh, we did this many views and that's what it is in media dollars. And that's why it's really worth it to be with us. It's like, no, no, no cash in hand in the bank that is traceable. You did this action. 
this consumer did this thing and they wouldn't have done that without that action that you took. And therefore we get, we count that profit against your work. Yeah. So Ted, I want to jump back a little bit. You, you mentioned a very personal story um, in the opening of the conversation. You said your dad passed away when you were in high school. What, what kind of lessons do you still remember from your dad? Um, so, uh, good question. Um, so my dad was always happy. So he made business decisions and family decisions and life decisions, and he was always pretty happy with those. So the deal I cut with myself was I was going to always be happy. And then there are some, you know, specific things that I did. Like I, I said, okay, between the end of the college and the time I'm 30, I get to do anything I want to do. But by the time I'm 30, I need to have figured out what the plan is. So I guess I was patient with myself and gave myself some grace. So as you noted in the upfront, you know, I worked at Booz Allen for a while. I also uh, wrote a book uh, and I was terrible at writer uh, and I was pretty decent management consultant. And then I did politics for a little while and that was really fun. I was actually pretty good at that, but wasn't the greatest that I could be. And then I always wanted to go to one of the five great business schools. And so I did. And it turns out that I just crushed it. I loved it. It was, it wasn't work. It was fun. Like every moment was fun. And so I was like, okay, so I guess I should be doing this because this brings me the most joy. So that whole happiness and then also having patience with myself, because again, as a male child, you know, my, the hemispheres of my brain don't fully connect until the mid twenties. <laughs> and, uh, my spouse, who's with me even back then, can definitely attest to, oh, I'm not really sure um, what was going on at age 23. But you give yourself some patience, and you're happy, and um, and there you go. Now, it, it sounds like as, as you were planning that part of your life, your, your 20s into your 30s, uh, there was a lot of goal setting. You know, the goal to be happy, the goal to get to a – uh, top tier business school, uh, uh, the goal to get your your direction in place by the time you were thirty, uh, and and to me that really speaks of a more mature approach, uh, a, 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 an early adoption of this notion of patience. Well, thank you. I I think a lot of people would definitely debate the mature part of that, um, <laughs> but. Uh, You know, everybody reacts differently. Since you mentioned it, everybody reacts differently to death um, and or the loss of a parent, however you're going to do that. And I just happened to get lucky. And one of the parts of my reaction to that was uh, something that could be helpful. And then so you just go on. Now, for those of you who are listening to it, it sounds super awesome and la-di-da. Let me just tell you, it's really crazy, ridiculous, expensive to do it this way. Like I didn't have you know, a job that I went from A to B to C to D, um, you know, over a decade period and, hey, I've got this thing and then I'm going on, right? I would, since I was always doing something different, I was always starting over. So I, I definitely miss the, uh, I still rented my place in DC, like the whole time I was in DC. It would have been great had I had an actual job um, and I knew that I could afford a mortgage. It would probably been better if I bought my apartment instead of renting it for like eight years. So it is expensive. Uh, eventually you catch up with your peers, um, but it is, it is not easy uh, and you have to make sacrifices. Um, but that's, that's the whole patient thing. And I've always been pretty good about making something happen. So I started, you know, I started was practicing as an entrepreneur in the fourth grade when Mrs. Pullen, my fourth grade teacher, wrote up the word entrepreneur on the board really early in the morning. She got there before me. I always got to school at like 745 so I could set up my illegal candy store. Um, and I was definitely <laughs> fooling everybody, hiding my goods behind my trapper keeper notebook. Um, totally sly. Nobody knew what was going on. And I, Mrs. Pullen wrote this word on the board, and I'm precocious enough to say, what is that? And she's like, I think you should go look it up. So we had one of those big American heritage dictionaries with the gold eagle embossed on the top. And uh, so you're flipping through it. And 
I read the definition. I was like, oh, that's me. And, uh, and I totally remember Cece looking at me, her looking at me, and she said, uh, I thought you might think that was interesting. So that's another thing. You know, if you practice long enough, you can have the luxury of being patient uh, because you know eventually it'll work out because it's worked out in little bits and tiny bit drabs, uh, you know, for a while. So you have confidence. I love that when you asked your teacher what entrepreneur meant, she didn't just tell you. And I mean, that's a classic teacher thing. She said, go look it up. hundred percent. Right? And, yes. and just think about where we are today. <clears throat> you know, I have, I have a couple of teenagers here at home and one of them is more curious than the other. <laughs> the, the, the incurious one, you know, I'm struggling with, but that's perhaps just a phase. Let's hope. Uh, and, and they, they ask me, you know, Hey, what's this, what's that? And, and they're always on their phones. Right. And I said, you know, it's amazing. If only you had the power of a supercomputer in the palm of your hand where you could get to that information. Right. So I, I try to refrain from telling them and I, I give them the kind of look it up type speech. I mean, you had an American heritage dictionary at hand. They've yes. got they've got the computer, and you you have a uh, a high schooler, recent recent graduate. So how how do you speak to him? His generation is, you know, this instant gratification generation. How do you speak to him about the essence of patience? So I think if he was here, I think he would say poorly, and he would give a really big eye roll and just like walk out of the room. Um, I, you know, I think you have to. So on the patient thing. I think children definitely are raising children definitely takes patience. Um, and I think that's why people are, you know, if you have multiple children, like the third one out of school, you're like, yeah, just go ahead. You're good. I'm, I'm pretty patient with you because the other two have not messed up. And I was much more, you know, in watching them every day, like a hawk. Um, so with Abbott, he's our first. So he definitely got the full hawk treatment. Like, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, you know what? I think you just, I'm not actually sure that kids actually get as much instant gratification as previous generations did. I think it's easier for them to get instant gratification. Um, there's no more arguing with your parents about, oh, I'll pay for the extra phone line. And then, you know, dragging your yellow princess phone into your room and being on the phone all the time or having, or only having the kids in your neighborhood that you were the ones that you knew. And so you were always back and forth with them. Um, I think that we've been doing instant gratification, whatever the definition of that is for a really long time. Mm. I mean, I think that's what, I think that's what bars and nightclubs are like, Hey, I'm going to walk in and I'm going to see what happens and I'm going to get instantly gratified or not based on this. So I'm not sure that there's really much difference. And I think, um, you know, on this theme of patience, uh, I think it, the patience there is a two way street. I think it is the kids really knowing that you have their best interests and hearts. And even if you're super irritating to them, you know, you're not trying to be mean about it or, or restrictive. And I think for parents, it's just like, you have to remember they're not, uh, they're not 42. They are 18. They're 17. They are 14 and they're going to do stupid stuff. I mean, fortunately I remember me buying a pair of, um, of parachute pants at the merry-go-round when I was 16 <laughs> So, I, you know, I have a very good, strong visual in my head about I made stupid decisions, too. That one was really bad. Like, Kim Holiday is going to really notice me at church because I'm wearing these parachute pants. <laughs> oh, my gosh. For it those of you who don't know, this is when we went shopping at malls, and this was like Forever 21, but way more cheesy. And I was trying to be cool in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia in like the mid-80s. And that's what I thought I was going to do. And uh, turns out that uh, it wasn't cool. In fact, I'm sure they didn't sell a single. I'm sure the people at Mary go round said, up. Oh, Ted Wright just bought the pair of North Lake Mall. This is over. Sell it all. Sell it all. Move it out of the stores. No one is ever going to buy another pair. That's it. I, I, I feel that one deeply, Ted. Um, along with my, my pastel Miami Vice uh, jacket and T-shirt. Nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. Nice. So, I thought you were going to go maroon members only. Uh, well, chess king, you know. Chess I mean, king. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
I, I, this is this is great. I mean, I always have a good time talking with you. So, when when we were talking initially, when I when I asked you to come to uh, the show here uh, and and talk about patience, which you know, you as a, a high energy person, you know, kind of questioned my sanity when I asked that. We were talking about empathy with respect to patients and 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 caring enough. Um, about other people to 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 show this this idea of of patience to them, and, and you said something to me about because you're a guy who's always been interested in speed, but you said something to me about having employees and what that meant with respect to how you could achieve something. Do you remember what that was? I do. So thank you for setting that up so well. Um, So when you have folks that work with you um, and they are running on a different tempo than you, you have to make a decision to give them the space to do the work at the pace that they are most comfortable doing the work, whether that's faster than you or slower than you. So you have to be I think you have to have empathy for them. You have to put yourself in their shoes and say, okay, this is what they're trying to accomplish. And this is why they're doing that. And as long as they meet, you know, these requirements. Now our requirements at the office are pretty high standard. Like we, we pay extremely well. We have zero people that I think are not intelligent that are working for us. I mean, and so it's, I got to keep feeding I got to keep, you know, throwing the chum in the pool because if not, everyone gets bored and they're like, okay, you know, let's, let's this get this spin out of control pretty quickly. So for us, it has always been about me practicing if I want to get the most out of people by being empathetic to them and giving them the space to create and the space to bring up and the space to own whatever it is that they're doing, then that works. And then for me, just as the leader, for those of you who are out there who are, you know, leading your troops, what I've always been impressed by other people, I'm like, gosh, they thought about something. And I think I said this before, literally, I would not have thought about that. That is such a good idea. I'm so glad they're working for me, with me. Let me make sure I tell them that. I'm a big praise person. Mm. Um, and also, by the way, so just on praise for just a second, uh, that actually works to your advantage when you need to be negative. So when people in our office hear me go, dude, I just, you know, that's, that's pretty lame. They don't take it as insulting sometimes. They take it as like, I've heard him say my stuff is really good and is amazing. And let me show it to everybody and like, come here, look at this. This is a great, this is exactly what we're thinking about. So if he is, if he is unimpressed by this, that means I missed something and I need to, I need to rethink this. Now, not always. I definitely am a jerk all the time to people. Try not to be, but I'm sure that uh, more people, uh, I'm a jerk to more people than uh, I would like to be. But at the end of the day, everybody, because you're empathetic and because you're about praise, when you don't do something well, and I say, mm, I do, and I use more specific language, then that's kind of lame. I'm just like, dude, that sucks. Are you, are you out of your mind? And that's just crazy. <laughs> that's not going to work. And you know that. And they're like, whoa. And I'm like, well, because of this, this, and this, and this. And they're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I I don't know where your head was at, but I know you're smart, so go back and, you know, do this. And here's an idea. And then they come back, and I'm like, there you go. Or if it's still wrong, I'm like, okay, I'm not saying this right, and then I'm taking it on me. I'm being super patient. I'm like, I'm not doing this right. So let's start over. Let's go back to first cases. Like, what are we trying to do with this thing? And then we build up from there, and we go on the journey together. Mm. And I think, I mean, on average, uh, uh, employees stay at Fizz uh, for right at nine and a half years. So, wow. And we have we have lots of people that have been here, you know, uh, just a little bit shorter distance than I have been here. So, um, I think it works. Everyone seems to like it, and everyone seems to come back every day and get on Zoom calls and be and bring up really smart stuff. So. Yeah. Well, it, it it sounds like the way you've set it up, the way you have you know, 
certainly praised them and shown them empathy along the way that the the goal there is uh, perhaps simply not to disappoint you um, because they have the same level of empathy for you. Well, and I think it's also the, that's an interesting point. I think it's also uh, disappointing the group. Like, you know, mm. when you're all doing stuff together, I mean, you know, we're, we're a lot of people all over the world, but I work really hard to make sure that everyone's feeling like they're con- contributing and everyone's feeling a part of this thing. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, I want to let down the group and the work is really fun because we don't take clients we think are lame. So there's lots of people that we can't work with because I'm like, nah. Yeah. Ted, you, you, you mentioned this wonderful team that you have. Now, we all have different personalities, and we all have uh, different levels of uh, you know, willingness to accept mistakes and to rush things along. As you've demonstrated patience yourself, have you seen how that affects the rest of the team and their willingness to extend patience themselves? Um, I mean, you'd probably have to ask them. I mean, that comes a little bit, oh, we're so awesome. Um, I think I have. Um, I think there's people in my office that are even more patient than I am. And I think I've learned to watch them and listen to them and also ask them. I'm like, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. What do you think? And they're like, mm, that's moving a little fast for some of us. I'm like, okay, well, what do you think the right timeline is? And they'll be like, oh, I think this. And I'm like, sometimes I'm like, mm, you know. Uh, I can go for about half that um, because also we have a job to do. And also we have certain expectations that people need to make. And, uh, you know, the reality is that humans always want to get more and do less. And that's not being mean to anybody. That's just all humans everywhere since St. Augustine. Right. Sure. So uh, I don't, I don't begrudge anybody that, but it's our job to make sure that, you know, we're doing work that's so awesome that people will remark on it to other people. And so sometimes, uh, sometimes that's, you got to push people a little bit and maybe that's impatient or maybe that's not, I don't know. That uh, probably other people have to define that. I probably can't define my own self patience with other people. Sure. No, that, that, that's, that's fair. That's fair. So, um, can you talk about maybe another client that you've, uh, engaged that has had a, um, you know, a, a significant challenge and that has uh, been patient themselves or either granted you uh, the patience that you've needed to uh, pull off your work with them? Well, I think, you know, at this point, I think all of our clients, because we're practicing this patience thing and because we also know that nobody is patient, everybody wants more yesterday uh, and it's already today, and you haven't even done gotten done with yesterday. So for me, it is about setting out the timeline and to whatever victory they need to declare and getting everybody comfortable with all the data behind, like, this is the best way forward, period. And some people don't want to do it. Some people are like, nah, we can do it. And I'm like, okay. Bona, you know, bona fortuna. Um, and about 10% of them come back to us within 18 months and said, so, you know, remember that thing we said? Yeah, that really didn't work. So can we do it your way? And we're like, sure. We're very glad to have you. We're very, we're very glad. We do not begrudge anybody. We just say, hey, we just didn't do a good enough job explaining it. Or they didn't really have, they did not have the timeline to, I mean, we get this all the time. Like, oh, my boss needs, and it's like, okay, well, we always say, uh, so we're the department of word of mouth marketing. Magic is next door and, you know, we're alphabetical. So M-A-G is before M-A-R. So they're the one, they're the, they're the people next door. <laughs> people are like, okay, that's pretty funny. And I'm like, eh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying that, you do not turn around a company who has been sucking wind for four years in a quarter. You just don't. And then sometimes you have a conversation with people and then they really pressing the case. I'm like, cool. Find me three examples of that. Go. And, you know, I'll wait. And, you know, they can't because it doesn't exist. Mm. You know, at this point in the United States and in mature media markets around the world, broadcast is not your effective friend 
at getting people to try something? Is your effective friend at getting people to remind them about something that their friends have already told them? I mean, we talked about Elon Musk. I mean, Elon Elon is going to get the United States off the internal combustion engine. And he knew it was going to take a while, and he knew he needed to start having conversations with people from the beginning. So at the very beginning of Tesla, it was really hard to find a brochure. But it was really easy to find somebody who would talk to you for as long as you wanted to answer every question, including Elon Musk himself, about the Tesla. And so once those conversations got going and some people bought and the story matched the experience, then they, a certain number of those people then became evangelists, became advocates, and said, oh, my gosh, y'all, you need to check out this Tesla, da-da-da. And so everything Tesla has done since then has built off that fundamental truth that broadcast is not what gets people to change. It is conversation between two people who know each other, and it is fact-based. That's what gets people to change. Mm. Yeah, you know, this brings to mind, I mean, obviously just last week, uh, Ford revealed the F-150 Lightning, uh, yes. their electric truck, which, you know, as the oh. as the most popular vehicle in the United States already, the F-150 is in a great position to affect a lot of other people. But at the same time, there's a lot of skeptics, there's a lot of people who believe in the traditional internal combustion engine in that regard. And it reminds me of when I first joined Ford. Uh, I used my own accounts, my own social media accounts to have conversations with people because I believed in where the company was going. And that level of personal credibility that I brought to the conversation made people pay a lot more attention than just ads that were running, as you say. Yes. And so I'm super excited, actually. So we should talk about the lightning. So I'm super excited about the lightning. So there's some fundamental questions that Ford needs to answer on range, on torque, on how, you know, what happens if I mess up and I'm out of power? Like how quickly can I get power? Is there a reserve battery pack that you can sell me that I can haul around in the back of my truck? I mean, there's some stuff, but once they get that done, I mean, look, just, and this is everyone who's listening, we're going to wander into the world of what car next car is Ted buying. Um, I don't think that I'm ever going to buy an internal combustion engine again. Hmm. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with me, I have a car thing. Um, And so I'm just, I think it's really interesting that we're moving. And, you know, Elon had to be patient. He had to be patient with Mm -hmm. America. One person had to tell another and they told two friends and so on and so on. And a small percentage of them are going to come back to you as the originator of the story and say, tell me more. And going to say, tell me more here. Let's go for a ride. And it's quiet and it's this and it's that. And there's a supercharging station everywhere. And let me show you on the map. And then eventually they go to one of the dealerships and they're like, okay, I'm interested. And let me ask you some other questions. Like, what happens when the battery runs out? It says, we'll promise to replace it. If your battery fails, we'll promise to replace it at no cost. Okay, can I get that in writing? Okay, yes, we now have that in writing. Okay, cool. So here's my $80,000. Here's my $110,000. I will take one of your electric cars. Thank you. And I'll completely redo the way that I'm thinking. And I'll, you know, I can only go 300 miles in the car. And so I have to... And then to and then to refuel the car, to recharge the car, takes at least an hour. So that means my trip to the beach is now five and a half hours, six and a half hours instead of four because I'm going electric. But there's a supercharger station next to this really cool restaurant. And I like that restaurant. And it's a little bit more than halfway. And so I just refuel there and I recharge there. And it takes me 35 minutes and I have lunch and then I go to the beach. And I'm not burning old dinosaurs, and I get and I can take off and move really fast. And so, yeah. I like that. so in, in addition to the patience, someone like Elon Musk has had to exhibit in, uh, you know, getting these cars to market and and proving out on what you said, making the experience match the story. That's key, because the moment the experience is different from what you're telling people, you lose credibility. Um, but at the same time, we need, as far as this particular issue, uh, electric vehicles, we need Americans 
in particular, we just, let's just focus on one country at a time. We need Americans to begin to exhibit more patience because, as you said, uh, instant gratification is nothing new. And the individual car ownership mentality we've had in this country for the last hundred years has given people the ability to just get in the car and go wherever and whatever, uh, wherever they want at whatever time. And, and having an EV or having a shared vehicle or relying on Uber or something like that requires more patience. How do you think we as a society will begin to grapple with that? So I think we as a society will have to trade off like my patience is less expensive to me than what the alternative is. Hmm. So when gas is seven bucks or cars are really expensive or for whatever reason, or also there's a charging station as there's as many charging stations as there are Starbucks or as there are gas stations, like every BP has a charging station or we get, um, you know, we get battery packs currently it costs uh, what it costs around 80 bucks a kilowatt hour to store power at your home. Um, and so when that thing drops to like 55 bucks a kilowatt hour, um, that everybody's bat, that battery pack is going to be everybody's Christmas present. It's going to be, I don't know if everyone, anyone else is old enough besides me to remember, uh, the year of the microwave, like everybody's mom got a microwave. <laughs> they had been around for six, seven, eight years, but they were super expensive and they're crazy. And what's going to go on? And all of a sudden this thing showed up. And it was, I mean, I remember, I think my dad probably paid $220 for it. And it that was a lot of money back then. And it was a really big commitment for the like, okay, we're going to do this. And then it becomes permanent. So I think that's the other thing that happens. Just we have enough patience um, to wait for the cost of battery storage to go down far enough to where it just makes sense. And then we can park these things at home and then we can put panels on it. We can put panels on our house to pull power during the day and then we, we can recharge at night and we'll just leak out of the battery, the big batteries we have and put them in the smaller batteries that are in the car and then we'll drive off. It's amazing. And three trips a year when we're going to the beach or whatever or we're hauling our child from Atlanta to Dallas to go to college – we will rent an internal combustion engine that we can just put gas in and we can drive it for 12 hours one way and 12 hour, and then we'll drop it off and we will fly home in an electric plane. Well, I, you know, having, having more options like that, you know, we'll certainly be tempted to go back to the way we used to do things or the way we are the most familiar with. But to your point, it's about trade-offs and it's about, deciding what we value most and being able to exhibit a little more patience as a trade-off for, you know, treating our planet better or uh, perhaps eventually that lower cost alternative that we see. Yes. I think, I think that is a, I think that is a hundred percent true. I think we would do trade-offs and we just have to be patient to stick with the theme of the story here, We have to be patient and wait for that time. And, but we also have to be impatient for other people and like, you know, go ahead and plan and like, let's go. Um, yeah. My wife is an architect and she's already, when her next residential, she's already laying in uh, pipes uh, and conduit for that much electricity flow into the house. Mm. And also looking at somebody about what is the tech, what is the pad technology where you could wirelessly recharge your Tesla? Oh, Wow. <laughs> which totally, which totally exists. I mean, the technology exists now, but she says, you know, just like, just like putting speakers in your ceiling is really silly because they're up there for about a year and a half and the technology changes. You don't ever use them again. You don't want to bury something in the concrete right. and then have to dig it out or like laugh at this technology 10 years later. Right. It's right. something that you can plug in and out, but there will always be. So, you know, you're already starting to see people design their garages differently. Mm. Garages differently, power inputs into the home, uh, setting out open conduits so later you can easily snake lines between walls. Like you don't know what's coming next, but something's going to come. So let's just have a big opening, a, you know, five inch diameter pipe that is empty that just runs throughout the house or different parts of the house, and you can take things from one place to another. Yeah. Well, that that brings to mind um, one of the features they outlined 
on the reveal of the F-150 Lightning was that in the event of a power outage, which is the horror of um, many EV customers, you can actually power your entire home for up to three days from the F-150. It becomes your main power source. Yes. So that's the fun thing to think about. When you start thinking about that electric vehicles are big batteries on wheels, and then so basically you could have, you have you had a fully charged, now when you look at, and so this is an interesting thing, we can just delve into marketing. The amount of work that you have to do into your house to have that to be true, there's a lot of technical stuff you have to have. So you have to take that power out of the battery that is your car and you have to translate that into the power that your house works on. Right. Otherwise, you will do bad things. But it is doable. It costs about. It talks about. It takes costs about three thousand dollars to redo the power in your house in order to be able to do that. So, uh, in the ad, they're like, "Oh, let me just plug in here." And I was like, "Man, you are a far-thinking electrical engineering PhD candidate if you wired your house to take a battery." And run it, but you can do it. And so, what will happen in five or ten years, as we are patient and people are building homes, they're just asked to put that in the home, and it won't actually cost three grand anymore. It'll be like eight hundred bucks because you'll just add that in, and you have this big plug that you will use five times in the life of the house. But just like a sump pump, you'll be really glad you had one when you need it. Exactly. Little foresight, little patience. That's all that it takes. Well, Ted, it's been a real treat speaking with you this hour. I feel like we could probably continue the conversation in many different directions, and you know, maybe we will someday on another episode. Um, if people want to find out more about you and what you do, where should they go? So, if you go on Google and just type in Ted Wright and Fizz, you will find all kinds of ways to get in touch with us, and that's just the easiest way. I'm all over LinkedIn. If you're interested in LinkedIn, uh, I'm always commenting and having fun on LinkedIn, occasionally on Twitter, um, and definitely on the phone and in lectures. And I'm just super glad to talk to anybody about uh, anything marketing for sure. Also, old bourbons, cars, uh, um, ancient philosophy. I got, I got a million of them. Old Star Trek episodes. Who is the best Star Trek captain? Oh. I know. I know that's that. That's uh, dangerous territory. That is dangerous territory. I know that you, Scott Monty, can talk about uh, who is the best doctor for Doctor Who and certainly got all of the Sherlock Holmes stuff. But, yes, uh, always ready to have a conversation. So thank you very much, Scott, for having me on your program. This has been great. The calm and orderly mind, willing to take in information and wait for results, is expressed externally as patience. The patient leader gives people room to make mistakes and keeps an even keel. In doing so, they become trusted and admired leaders. Thank you for joining us and for being an advocate for timeless and principled leadership, whenever and wherever you find it. I'm Scott Monty. Until next time, May you dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. For you are a leader.